Hello, good evening, uh, and welcome to the Corporate Parenting Committee. It's now, well, it's just gone seven, it's uh, 7.03, and I'd like to start this meeting now. I'm Councillor Paul Arnold, and I'm the chair of this committee. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone present that the meeting is being live streamed uh, and recorded for publication on the council's website. Officers attending, I don't, is there anyone attending? No, There's nobody no, in so no, I forget no. that bit. And, and I will say just at this stage, if anyone indicates at the end of the table there, if you could just... Uh, Give me a nice big wave, because I know I didn't pick up on you a couple of times last time, thank you. Uh, item one, apologies for absence. Now, I, I've received a message from Councillor Polly, and I don't believe we have anybody else. Uh, item two, minutes. Uh, I move that the minutes of the Corporate Parenting Committee held on the 25th of January be approved as a correct record. Are there any comments? Oh, Councillor Carter. Uh, not a challenge in any way. I just wanted to say uh, earlier in the year I challenged the minutes of this committee for being not very detailed and I just wanted to thank the team for the way, way more detailed minutes this time and it's very good to see, so thank you for whoever drafted this. Yeah, I will, I will concur, actually. There is a vast improvement, so thank you for that. Um, item three. No, items... Oh. oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Councillor Card. Uh, um, Cecil, that's uh, duly noted. Thank you. Um, right, item items of urgent business. I've not received any it urgent items. Is there? Do anyone have anything? So no, none have been raised. Um, and item f agenda four: declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest? Nope. Item five. Thorough Young Voices. Uh, can I ask Thorough Young Voices to present their presentation to the committee? Thank you. All technical stuff, don't get me involved with that. Um, so hi, <laughs> um, obviously my name is Karolini from Young Voices, Dark Young Voices, and uh, for today we came with um, a few projects we've been part of, starting off with, we've been actually able to be part of the planning of CLA Awards, so Children Looked After Awards, um, so we've been doing meetings, um, and we've chosen our venues, which we held in Orsett, um, and the theme, which is carnival, but when we say carnival, we like bringing that, like different cultures and different diversities together, so that flags and people coming in to represent where they're from, we feel was needed and it would be an amazing opportunity for everyone just to, you know, come together and celebrate um, such an event. Um, we've also been part of making sure, you know, when they go to these celebration events that every young person still gets an award because as we know, I feel like every child should be celebrated, especially from everything they've been through um, to where they're now. It should be um, seen and spoken about. Um, so yeah, so we've been part of, that's one of the things, the CLA, CLA awards. And then um, we've been also part of a different event. Uh, we, during the, uh February half terms, we did a My Helping Care project, and that was really good because we had pe people from CAMS to come in, and we and a few of us young people attended, and we were basically talking about things that we liked, disliked, what they could do better, and basically just giving them improvements, whether or not our experiences, if we had experiences, and if they're good or bad. Um, we would, there was a couple of other ladies that came in, um, I can't remember what their part was, but one of the things we did with them was this game, it was more of a, what we thought were most important with these categories that we were given, with 
uh, a thirty million pound uh, budget that we had, and just seeing what we thought was um, good, what was like most important, what we would put as a top category, and also um, a health visitor assessment. assessment uh, um, looked after children's services. Looked after children's services. Uh, also attended and we said what we thought about the service uh, saying that sometimes we couldn't remember when the last one that we had whether it was consistent or not and um, and it and how we felt felt about it saying that it felt really professional like someone sitting there with their laptop doing their survey and we we uh, young people couldn't tell whether or not they were putting what we were saying um, or adding any extra information because we we don't get a copy of what they put. So we were saying idea of printing off that like form for us to fill in by ourselves with them. So then we know that what we've written is what is going to be put on the survey so then they can just write it up and then we just and then they just fill in all the additional information so that was basically what that project was about to make sure that what we were saying about those services were actually going to be put forward and actually going to be um dealt with uh so yeah Thank you. Um, sorry, lastly, I also wanted to mention, as you can see in our report, we have, you know, our 2024 goals, um, which is obviously we have this part of participation training, which we do, and um, Carly tends to train us to be able for us to interview social workers and many workers who work in the children's services. Um, but now we want to do, you know, we want to do more, but run by young people. Uh, we want more activities with workers involved. So not just having that barrier, you know, oh, that's my social worker. We really want all the workers to come to these events, you know, Grange Waters, all these events we held to for young people, also for workers. Um, we also discussed two big events for young people per year, like Young Voices at Grange Waters. If anyone has attended, they've seen how big that event can uh, get. Uh, we also have, like, Young Voices member packs, including a T-shirt uh, with, you know, Tharak Young Voices. We have a hoodie, and it's not either that. We also have like now lanyards with our names and pictures, and you know what we do in the Young Voices uh, team. Um, it also speaks about obviously power participation training for different workers, not just social workers, but also hopefully personal advisors and foster carers. Um, and we have also a craft session plan to create member packs for our Thoric Young Voices members. So they get to decorate their own bag and we're going to get notepads and stuff like that. So it's very personalised to them. And they also feel important. So they're coming in, it's like like their little job and they, you know, they sit there and they discuss what needs to be done. And we also have a day at Grange Waters booked for the 23rd of August 2024, which we'd love to see workers also coming to that and building a healthy and good relationship with their young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, very nicely read. Thank you very much for that. Um, before I open it up to uh, other members, I mean, I would like to just say, actually, I think we've had the uh, the invites through today for the Looked After Children Awards, which is fantastic. And I, I noticed we're going back to Allsit. Um, and I know we were there a few years ago, weren't we, several years ago, probably longer than I can remember, actually. Um, and it's a fantastic venue, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. So, I mean, I would really kind of recommend that as many people get, get along there as possible. It is a fantastic evening. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> I was just wondering, what, was the, what would you say is the best thing you've achieved this year as a group? Um, I feel we achieved a lot, mm. but I would say we started breaking that barrier between workers and young people. Mm. Like many of our meetings now, we are actually having um, workers coming in to s any of them. We've had obviously cams, we've had, I can't remember everyone, but we've had a few people and actually giving feedback and being a part of many of these events. 
So I'd say that's one of the big ones. But I'd also say being recognised. I think it feels amazing not to just be seen out know, just a group of young people, but in every event we go, such as now a conference, being able to sit here, I think that's one of our biggest achievements, I'd say, to be feel that we represented, but also speaking on behalf of young people. So I'd say that would be it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Young Voices. Uh, first of all, I must say well done this evening for coming here boldly enough to present your ideas to us. That's a, it's a very big progress, and it's a great ideas you have got today. And I believe you are actually shown the skills and the confidence which you are building, which I believe is going to go a very long way. I know you did mention parts of the project you haven't been involved this year. I wonder, everything interests me, but the one that interests me much is the carnival, which deals with diversity. Uh, I'd just like more elaboration on that. Thank you. Um, okay, so this idea came from, you know, I, I can say this, that I kept going back to the group and I said, you know what, we have many young people from different backgrounds and cultures, and it's not shown enough. Um, I can personally say I'm Portuguese, and I'd love to see you know, being spoken about and, you know, being feeling confident that even though I was not, you know, parents were still being um, celebrated. And then when we got the opportunity to do CLA Awards and actually be part of the planning and picking up the venues and the theme, I thought, why not do a carnival? And it went from carnival to also bringing different flags so people come in and just represent who they are, where they're from, and be proud of it, you know, and talk about it. So it becomes like a get together, we're celebrating obviously our young people, but also is a thing where we're celebrating our culture and background. Um, to a point, many of the stuff's in the carnival theme, we're gonna have different workstations, where it's to make a flags, and obviously masks is carnival, so we have masks and, you know, and they get to dress up. And when we say dress up, we're not saying, okay, you need to go out there and buy you know, an outfit, but you can make your own uh, or bring a flag with you or just come and celebrate instead of having that, so many rules what you can and cannot do. So it's like a big celebration, for, but run by young people that is fit to our young people, not just professionals. So, yeah. Thank you for the elaborate explanation. I, I think it's going to be a great day and I look forward to seeing that. I believe other people also look forward to seeing it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Carter. Thank you again for your, uh, bringing this report here again. I, I've really enjoyed reading it, and even in the suggestions, there are some topics that I would have considered at your age, uh, of, uh, at all young age, to consider quite awkward to discuss with your peers. So it's really great that you've been able to have those conversations. Uh, I just wanted a bit more um, elaboration on the optional survey before the health assessment so that young people might feel comfortable to ask questions or talk about things that are difficult. Is this like a, a week before to get them thinking or I was just a bit unsure what it was. So. Um, yeah, so it's literally, you know, having the option to do that sort of before because as you know it can be very awkward when you sit in front of a professional and we're talking about certain things that are not exactly comfortable to talk to anyone. Um, but it's that, that and also when the person comes to our house or when we go to to them to do that health you know assessment is very much instead of them doing the survey all of it and answering as if they know what is going on to actually give it to us and if we don't know the answers to some of them we sit together not just like oh I'm staring at you and you're just there writing and we don't know what's being put like um, Jasmine kindly said um, so it's literally having the option to actually do our own survey instead of a worker doing it for us um, hope that answers your question. It was um, when I, my experience in care, I'd, I'd, sit, I'd sit in my foster carer's living room and then there'll be about four social workers there. I'd, there you go, you get it. It's just, uh, it's just like, well, first of all, I only know two of you. <laughs> I, I don't feel comfortable talking to the other two. So I, I really like that you're making that argument that it needs to, we need to be able to do this properly. We need to be more comfortable doing it and then we get a more honest answer yeah that literally came from our group saying the same thing it is quite uncomfortable you coming downstairs and there's four people there or more and you're sitting there and you're having to answer different questions 
and some of them are very uncomfortable, especially if someone comes in a suit and very dressed up and sits in the sofa and we sit in there like, okay, either I've done something wrong or they're going to judge whatever we say. We don't want that, especially as you get older to teenagers and we all know that they experience different things. We really don't want for them to go behind our back and having to do stuff by themselves because they don't feel comfortable to talk to our professionals. Because um, this is all based on the young people in our council, especially children in care. So they need to feel like, you know what, they do care about us and it's not just a profession, but it's actually, you know what, we want to support them. We want to be able to make them feel comfortable and let's make a difference instead of just doing it for a job. Well, uh, I think uh, I think I speak for the whole committee when I say thank you for what you're doing. You're doing a great job at advocating for people in care. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mamor. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to first um, echo what everyone else has already said in terms of the great job that you guys are doing. It's been really nice to have you to come to these meetings and to speak because you guys are the best place people to speak about your own experiences. It's one thing to read it on a piece of paper. It's another thing to actually have you guys talk about it. So well done. Um, I found it really interesting. Um, I think Councillor Carter mentioned it in terms of the suggestions. Um, well done with those, especially the one to do with... Um, leaving a basket of sanitary wear available for female looked after children. I think that's a very, very important one. And some of these things, as you said, it's not easy to talk about or it might be awkward or uncomfortable. And as you said, when you get into teenage, we are a teenager, like there's a lot of things going on. So I think that's like a really, really good one. And well done for putting that down as a suggestion. Um, I think you've touched on a really important point about the formality of like professionals and how that can like, impact how likely you are to really open up. Because as I've said, you guys are the best people to talk about yourselves. But I can imagine that if you're sat in a room and there's a like suit and tie and multiple people you don't know, like just anyone really, you're not going to really want to open up about personal things. So I think that's something that could be taken forward. And also the support for care leavers as well was touched on in the other feedback in terms of they feel like when they eventually leave care, there's that support seems like it may reduce. And like in terms of ways that I think we all could work together in terms of improving that, that would be really, really interesting with the committee going forward. So just as a whole, well done for like putting this all together. It's been really, really interesting. And it's nice to see like young people being able to like, sit down and advocate for themselves. It's really important. So that's what I'd say. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll let them. Yes. Um, as you get older, you find it very difficult to... So it's not just younger people. As you get older, when you're in these um, situations, you, you can't really take on board what they're all saying because you're thinking of what you're going to be saying and, and, and you're not on your own. It's quite difficult. Have you thought about bringing a friend? Is it, would it be helpful to have a friend who, who came with you? Uh, sorry, to the meeting? Or yeah, like the yeah. Health We'd love to... But it's obviously how comfortable a young person is because, for example, being in care is not something that every young person is proud to talk about. Or is, sometimes you're scared, you know. Um, I mean, the world is not perfect. It's not People are not nice all the time. And to go out there and say, you know what, I'm in foster care and I have all these assessments compared to, I don't want to say ordinary or normal, but compared to someone, another young person they wouldn't have. So it does depend on the young person. But if it does make them feel you know, safe and that they can speak more, then 100% we would obviously say to social workers to actually, do you know what, if they have a good friend, let them come to meetings so they can feel comfortable and actually chair some of these meetings. Say, do you know what, I'm here, this is about me, and we will discuss it now instead of sitting back and being scared to talk about it. But it is a good idea, and that's what we'd love to go on and do, like having young people controlling their meetings and bringing who they feel should be in our meeting to support them. Sorry, can I just ask, is this for the initial health assessment or the annual health assessment? Annual health assessment. As I find it, obviously, um, I look after, looked after children, but we usually just get a lack nurse come round who's quite informal um, and they, um, we do get a copy of the report that she's written. 
that's given, um, it's given to us and it's also given to our foster children. So I just wonder how comes it is, you know, you're saying that, you know, they fill bits in. You can, they, the children do have the opportunity to look at that and if they're not happy, they can. And I, I just find it really odd you're saying that there's like three people. I've never, I've very, to get three professionals in a room at the same time can mm. be hard, let alone for a health assessment. So yeah. we only usually get our lack nurse. So I was just confused at what that, when they're all dressed up in suit and tie. Mm. Um, so it's all different as obviously some young people have good positive feedback and they've made them feel comfortable but some of us it will be a thing where they do come so dressed up and so professional and they'll say they'll make you feel uncomfortable to a point the young person won't feel comfortable to speak up and the report for example they're meant to get it but some of us don't actually see a report I can speak on my behalf I haven't seen some of the reports um, that was made or for example COVID around COVID time Obviously, was everything done either for the phone? I know mine has been done for the phone. And uh, it's a thing. It, it doesn't break that barrier. It becomes uncomfortable. We don't know what they're writing. Um, so it, it does depend on your own person. The foster care as well. If you obviously have a supportive foster care, which is fundamental, then the young person is aware of everything. But some of us don't have that experience. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just 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 really just summing up really. I mean, obviously going through your report is very interesting. Um, I've, I've, I've highlighted here, the, you know, your, your health assessment comments and the and the suggestions. It's all very very interesting. Um, and I would really like to say, and I probably am going to sort of echo maybe a couple of little comments we've had already from committee members. It's it's really really pleasing to see how sort of young young uh, voices is developing and you know confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're coming to committee now with. A very well prepared report you know mm. we're getting good engagement from the committee it's fantastic and I, and I actually think it really has moved on a lot in the last sort of year and a half or so that I've been sitting on the committee so uh, yeah congratulations for that and uh, thank you very much for your presentation thank you thank you thanks uh, and with that uh, if we could just now move on to item number six please and that is um Ooh, and I think that is Janet. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do apologise. I'm skipping over my own report. <laughs> <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> they got Luke worried. <laughs> um, yes, obviously. The, uh, let's just turn to this in the agenda. Obviously, I've had the uh, I've had the opportunity to. Um, to go through the uh, report that will be presented to um, full council in June, I believe. I don't clarify today. Um, but hopefully everybody's had a chance mm -hmm. to go through yep. it. I'm, I'm very happy with it. And I think Jenny, Jenny Shea prepared that for me, which I, so I'll give her thanks for that as well, please. Um, just a couple of little comments, actually, before anyone wants to come in. I mean, I, again, just, just actually going back to my previous comments... Um, it was said to me before I went onto this committee that it's it's actually quite a friendly committee, um, and I really would like to just reiterate that there is, you know, it can be quite harsh our political world, can't it? But um, there seems to be a real good cross-party um, discussion going on with this committee, and it's very pleasing to see. And actually, you strike up good relationships with other members where perhaps you wouldn't normally do that. Um, and I'd also like to thank the um, co-opted members for everything they do. So as we go through, I'll probably have more to say if I get to, get to present to a full council, but we'll see about that one. So any questions, please? Councillor Carter. Well, uh, you, uh, you, um, you said most of what I wanted to say, Chair, of thanking everyone. And I just want to say I've sat on this committee uh, for three years. As soon as I uh, became a councillor, I said I wanted to go on this committee. And uh, certainly over at least the last two years, that it has been uh, fantastic for, as you say, non-political. It's very much the unwritten rule. In this committee, you leave your rosettes at the door. And everyone has followed that so fantastically over uh, the, the two years. There, there was, uh, there's never been an incident here. And that is just uh, tantamount. And I've, I've got to congratulate you as well for your chairing of this. You've always been incredibly bipartisan. 
and uh, giving everyone their voice. And we get great engagement in this committee. Like everyone has their say. Um, and I, I just think it's a very warm, warm nature committee. And uh, well, I've, I've taken my hat off to you for your well chaired way of this committee. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> that caught me by surprise. Um, yeah, no, I think it's just a decent thing to do, really. We're not here to sort of fight battles between ourselves, so, uh, and, it, and it's not really the reason why we're here in the first place. Um, and I will actually give you credit, because it was you that actually passed that comment on to me about the friendly committee, and you, gave, you did give me a lot of very good advice going back a, a short way. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, like I said, we'll see we'll see what happens in June. But uh, I might I might have the opportunity to stand up and speak on it. We, I might not. We'll just see. Um, right. The recommendation is um, that the contents of the corporate parenting annual report be noted. noted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. If you could uh, take us away on item item seven. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Um, so this, re this report is around uh, the performance of children's social care, um, our corporate parenting responsibilities, and it provides information on the performance across children looked after and after care. Um, um, the overall performance is good. Um, this report focuses on data. So I think for young people, we had a conversation outside of this about you know, numbers, graphs, and just trying to kind of put a bit of context around it for young people. Um, I explained that we talk about statistical neighbours and we're usually talking about local authorities that are similar in size and make up to Thurrock. Um, when we're talking about national, obviously we're talking about the whole country. And then we talk about the regional, we talk about the region. And the region isn't necessarily like us. Within the region, South End is probably the closest in terms of make up and size. So it's uh, comparing us against Essex, for example, isn't really... Um, a good comparison because of the size and nature of the authority. So this report is um, reporting on the end of quarter three, so our year starts um, on the 1st of April and ends at the end of March, and so this, is, this data is up to the end of December um, 2023. Um, so we had, at the end of quarter three, around 200 and... 92 young people were receiving a service, 200 and, oh, sorry, the data's moving. So we, our numbers of looked after children has remained fairly stable. Um, care leaving service is, continues to be a focus for improvement. We know that there's some work to do in that area and we really want to kind of make outcomes for young people who are care leavers good. Um, but we recognise that there's work to be done to kind of get that where it needs to be. And that includes things like improving our offer, making sure young people absolutely know what's on offer for them, um, making sure that they're getting the right support at the right time, and that when they get to 18, they feel relatively ready, as ready as they can be at 18, but also recognising that not all young people are ready at 18, and some will be ready at 19, some at 20. Um, yeah. So... In terms of the uh, summary, I'm not going to read out everything that's in the report. So what I would say is that our looked-after numbers have remained fairly stable throughout the year. Um, when you compare us against our statistical neighbours, our looked-after numbers are fairly, you know, they're, they're in a good position. Um, we're at 291 um, at the end of December. Statistical neighbours in 2022-23, which is the, the comparison we have, was around... 411 so that's pretty good in terms of our looked after numbers we've managed to kind of keep them very stable so we started in October 2022 at 292 and ended in December at 291 we had a bit of a spike in June and July and that was when we had a slightly higher number of unaccompanied asylum seeking children entering into our care numbers um, in terms of the unaccompanied asylum seekers, you can see again that that has been, you know, we've seen a rise um, when the num when our proportion changed um, in 2022. We've more or less stayed at our number. Our number is 44. We've been above it, we've been at it, and we've been slightly below it. So when we get to 44, we transfer to other local authorities. And considering our... You ask number, our unaccompanied asylum seeking number of children has gone up. 
it's, I think, quite good that our numbers have looked after children have still remained steady, which in real terms shows a reduction in our looked after numbers. And why it's good that our numbers are decreasing, because it means, hopefully, that we're enabling more young people to stay at home. And if we can get them to stay at home with their families, that's the best outcome, ultimately, as long as it's safe. Um, there's a graph there about children ceasing to be looked after, and the most um, common reason um, was that they either stayed with their current carers or their carer was taken over by another local authority in the UK, and that's because we do transfer out, you ask if we get over our number. There's a graph there that shows the total number entering care, as opposed to the numbers entering care who are unaccompanied asylum seekers, and you can see that it's about... It ranges between a third and a quarter of our entering carers, you ask. Um, it's normal to see fluctuations in terms of the starting episodes and, and ending episodes, because also children end care because they reach 18. There's a number of reasons why children might end, um, cease to be cared for. Our number, are, in terms of gender, we always have more boys than girls, and that's not unusual. And for Thurrock, we will always have more boys because I would say if we've got 45 unaccompanied asylum-seeking young people, you, we might have two that are female. They are largely male. So that's quite a good proportion of our looked-after numbers. So there's always more males. In terms of ethnicity, the majority of our children, as you'd expect, are white British, and then it's a combination of um, black or black British, um, dual heritage, Asian or Asian British, and any other background. And then there's a very small number there, which is probably a data error, because we should always know what the ethnic background of our children is. And so that's something that has to be looked into, because we should know all of our children, what their background is. Um, in terms of ages, we're seeing a larger uh, percentage of children, young people age 16 plus, and a lower percentage in the age group, one to four. And this kind of, to some extent, reflects our status as a point of entry for separated migrant US children. Uh, you can see the age distribution, and there's some graphs set out there. In terms of children with disabilities, we have, um, we've had between nine and 11% of our uh, looked after population have been children who have a disability, and that's fairly stable. Um, got a section there on our youth offending service, but um, Claire Moore is here today and she's going to be presenting a report on youth offending, so I won't really go over that too much. And so I won't talk about youth detention and out of court disposal. Um, in terms of our looked after children who are missing, um, between April 22 and March 23, about a total of 530 missing episodes, but that relates to 52 individual children. Um, and it's a reduction on the previous year. Not a huge reduction, but it is a reduction. Um, children looked after return home interviews. This was an area for focus for us in terms of making sure that when children are missing, we're able to kind of have those conversations about why they're going missing and trying to make a difference, really, so that we can reduce our, our, our missing episodes, so trying to understand the reasons behind why children go missing. Um, it was an area for, that needed improvement at our last um, focus visit with Ofsted, and we have really um, we've brought the return home interviews back in-house, and what we can see is that a lot more children are being seen when they come home, and we're having those conversations around the push and the pull factors and why they're going missing. So I think if you look at the graph, um, you can see that there is, we have had a significant period of time where we've had young people accepting interviews. I think at the time we had our last focus visit, our performance was quite a bit significant bit lower, which isn't shown on that graph, but it was quite significantly lower. Um, a large amount of our children, in a, we're always at above 90% of our children are always seen in time scale. The, 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 the times that children are visited depends on how long they've been in care. So um, if a child is in care, enters care, they should be seen within the first week and then so many days afterwards. If they're in a long-term placement where they're part of the, they feel like they're part of the family and they're settled and matched, you might move to visits every three months. Um, so it depends on the needs of the child. 
It doesn't mean that if it's set at three months, you can only visit every three months. If you think that there's something going on with the child, you should still be going back and visiting and having those conversations. So sometimes you might visit more, sometimes you might visit less, but there's a minimum in terms of what's expected. And those are, those are really set up in our systems that we can tell and make sure that children are being visited as they should be. Initial assessments remains an area of needing significant improvement. Um, I know we've discussed it numerous times at this committee. Um, it still remains an area of focus. Um, we have had um, a meeting with our health colleagues and we've got a task and finish group. I think another meeting is set up to look at the way forward and we're hopeful that we'll start to see um, some improvements. Um, there's information there about the timeliness of adoption, um, the numbers of children who are adopted. Um, Thorough is a small authority, so we're usually talking about very small numbers. Um, there's a section there on the distance um, from home. Ideally, the best thing for children is to be as close to home as possible so that they can have contacts, so that they can stay within their communities, maintain their friends, go to the same school. Um, so... One of the benchmarking is around children being within 20 miles or less from their home. Obviously, we want it to be less than 20 miles, but that's, that's the benchmarking data. And 261 um, of our 291 children were placed within that 20 mile um, radius. Um, that's fairly comparable with uh, statistical neighbours. There's information there about care leavers, um, education, employment and training. Again, this is an area that we're constantly looking at, trying to get children and young people into education, employment and training. Um, we know that for the best outcomes for children is for them to be working and to be able to kind of support themselves and to feel independent. And one of the ways you feel independent is being able to look after yourself financially. Um, it, Suitable accommodation is another area that we're really focused on. It's making sure that children are in the right place at the right time. And when young people reach 18, as I said, making sure that hopefully they can be where they need to be. So not assuming that because you're 18, you're ready for your own flat. For some young people, it will be staying put with their foster carer. For some young people, it will be going into supported accommodation. And for some, it will be going into their own accommodation. We're in touch with uh, the majority of our care leavers. Um, the requirements around being in touch for care leavers is not necessarily to, to visit them every day. So it should be dependent on the young person's needs. So, for example, if you're a young person at university, um, as Caroline said earlier, um, being in care isn't necessarily something you want to advertise to the whole world. So if you're going off to university and you're starting afresh and you're meeting new friends, you probably don't want your social worker turning up in your halls of residence, kind of, you know, advertising to everybody that you're in care. And I think that should be, um, the contact that we have with our care leavers should be led by our care leavers. So it can be a phone call, it can be text messages, it can be a FaceTime video, um, and if they need it, it should be face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's probably the end of the report, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Janet. That's an uh, excellent report as usual. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions, please? Oh, yes, Chair, I I, I've got it. Councillor Cecil got in first. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a, mo yeah, a I, moment's I, notice, then. I've read through the report earlier, and, and, and it said you have your own paediatricians and, and own health visitors or something to do this. If the family has a good relationship with their GP, why can't the GP... Do their own GP do this uh, initial health assessment? Why does it have to be somebody in your silo? Maybe there's some local authority staff would not have um, paediatricians as part of their request for that information. Yeah. Um, and they would be the paediatricians and the health services are uh, uh, delivered by their health. But the, the, excuse me, we're talking across you. The, the health of the assessment has to be done by the, this group. So the, the, the statutory responsibility it has to be a paediatrician at the moment. Yeah, see, you see, it's a national thing, though. It's, not a, it's not a thoric thing. It, <laughs> it says isn't. in here that they're short supply. Yeah. 
They are. They are very much in short supply. And one of the things that we've been trying to push NHSE uh, around is is uh, um, actually um, trying to change and move forward legislation so that actually GPs can be uh, or alternatives Especially to their own paediatricians. GP, that, would that be acceptable? Well, I, I mean, with the right training and skills. I mean, obviously not not all GPs are, are um, uh, you know, specialise in children. So, you know, your paediatrician is, is, is the most appropriate person at the moment. But that doesn't mean to say that others can't be trained to do that role. And I think in the NHS at the moment, we have a lot of kind of actually looking at kind of alternative skill mixes, and this should be one of them. Um, our health visitors with the right training and also our, uh, our um, uh, lack nurses with the right training, they do the, they do the follow-ups. Um, so, so, I mean, we're innov innovation-wise, we're very open to that, but it's just obviously at the moment, legislatively, it's, um, it has to be GP, it has to be um, paediatrician. Sorry, it's legislation? Yeah. All right. Thanks very much yeah. for your good answer. Your full answer. Thank you. Just just before I move on, very, uh, Councillor Cecil, if you could just indicate when you wish to speak, and then I'll come to you, because other people do get in before you actually speak. Thank you. Um, and I, I believe we've... Oh, please do more than try. Um, <laughs> Councillor Hartstein, next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, just looking at US, just wondering, where do you manage to place your US? Do they manage to go with families for that care? Or are they placing semi-independent living? Or is it a range? So it can be in a range of options. It depends on the age of the young person, what their experiences have been. If they're, un if they're, if they're under 16, it has to be in a foster placement. Um, if they're over 16, I don't know if they're... Because the majority are over 16. If they're over 16 and maybe, say there's two or three and they've come together and one is nearly 18, one's 17 and one's 16, they may want to be placed together. We may not have a foster placement, but their independent skills, because of what they've been through, might mean that they're fairly advanced in terms of their independent skills. So we'll look for supported accommodation where they'll get that one-to-one -one support as well. Um, so it's a, it's a combination. We have some young people who are in foster care, they do really well in foster care, but also you have some young people, they don't want to be with a family, they know who their family is, and they might prefer to be in supported accommodation. So we try and sort of work out what's best for each individual young person. Thank you. And could I just follow up, Chair, if that's yeah, OK? Yeah. What, what's the youngest, do you ask, we have at the moment in Thurrock? Sorry, it's an on-the-spot question, sorry. <laughs> Do you have another question, or would you like some? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, far away with another sorry, question. I think we'll, we'll, for me, give, sorry. we'll give Janet a little, a little pause to... Uh, oh, I'm going to go on to point. another question about that, though. It's just about the care leavers um, being neat. But, um... Sorry, <laughs> no, I didn't have to do two things. Um, Multitasking. Indeed, indeed. indeed. Oh, yeah. um, obviously, I, I know you've high, you've sort of touched on it, the 52% of the care leavers um, are in part-time or full-time education, um, and it's obviously below the statistical neighbour of the average of 55. What do you think has contributed to that, that gap? Um, some of that... The, the, the thing with comparing to statistical neighbours, we're always comparing a year behind. So we never know what, so we're comparing last year with our performance of this year. We are starting to see some improvement. Mm -hmm. Some of it will be around the changing, I think some of it will be around some of the changing dynamics of the looked after service. So as we have more you ask, um, it's kind of, you might end up with less in a common, in in employment training and employment. It depends on the ages, so it depends on which age and category you're looking at. So for some of our older young people, they will be open to us post a certain age. And part of the reason they'll be open is because they're either not managing in terms of accommodation or they're not managing in terms of being able to find employment. And so it's usually those young people that remain open because of additional problems they have. 
why we're different from our statistical neighbours. We are talking small numbers. Um, I don't know. I know there's lots of work going on from our education colleagues. Um, there's lots of work going on at the Inspire Hub. Um, we're constantly looking at different opportunities for our young people. We actively would like to encourage um, apprentices, apprenticeships within the council. We're also trying to write and we're also talking about conversations about commissioning and when we're commissioning services and trying to um, identify services that we're commissioning that can actually gainfully employ some of our young people. It's just trying to find different opportunities. It depends on what age young people come into our care um, as well. That can often impact on their their chances in terms of the outcomes. So sometimes, you know, if you come into care, I don't know, at the age of 16, your um, at school attendance hasn't been great, then you're going to be further behind than somebody who's been at home and been going to school regularly throughout their life. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I love looking at the graphs every time. It's just the way I like to absorb information. And I, I just want to highlight, first of all, the, the last two, care leavers in touch and care leavers in suitable uh, accommodation. What I really like about this is that you can see a marginal gain over time to uh, where we're already above the statistical neighbours, but uh, we're still improving as well. And it's really great to see. I'd rather see like a 1% increase each quarter uh, to, towards a goal, then like for the I, 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 um, initial health assessments, we can see big jumps of 40%, but you know it's so volatile it's going to go down again, whereas if you see that just consistent improvement, you know the service is doing amazing in this area. So I really want to welcome those two. Um, Councillor Hardstein uh, uh, said uh, uh, quite a bit about what I wanted to say about um, uh, not in education, employment and training, and uh, I sound disappointed with how it went, because we just got back above this. So this is an area for it has historically been quite good on. And we were just, we got just back above the statistical neighbour average. I know we're discussing that. It's very, it, 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 because of the small numbers, it makes a big difference. But we, we historically, we were always above this. Now we got slightly above it, and now we're back under it again, which is a bit annoying. But there is still a lot of work ongoing, um, as has been pointed out. And uh, I, I will be... Um, Seeking a put quite a, um, an update tomorrow from from the officers in education to um, to see what's happen um, to see when the next panel is and uh, again expressing my desire to go and I know Councillor Arnold would probably like to come along as well like he like he you did come to the last one didn't you? no no okay well <laughs> yeah so uh, I don't have a question actually there I've just realised that so I do apologise um, if I just come back on that though just slightly so. In terms of the measurement of young people who are in education, employment and training, in touch or, what's the other one, suitable accommodation, um, we're restricted in terms of where we can count it from. So I think it's one month before and three months after their birthday. So we can't just, it's never one moment in, it's one moment in time. So it isn't necessarily where we are today, it's where we were in relation to their birthday. Um, so there is that as a caveat as well that it's not. I couldn't. I can't necessarily say to you. I mean, we do measure it, but it is at one moment in time. Um, so yes, but yeah, we're always disappointed. We want as many of our young people to be employed or uh, in training as possible, really. And sorry, Councillor Hart, Arstein. Um So we have the youngest young person in care who's uh, um, unaccompanied asylum seeker is 14. We have two 14-year-olds. And we have one, two, three, four, six 15 year olds, and the others are 16 and above. So, all of those that will, uh, so those um, eight young people will all be in foster care. Councillor Carr? It's quite troubling like, uh, where they were unaccompanied so young. Uh, I, I know that I realise that's probably the age they were now, but uh, uh, sorry, I have to ask. Um, what age were they when they were they did, were they part of the big group that arrived in June, or, or just, if if that's just <laughs> ridiculous, just let me know to uh, to not ask that because I I, I, I get that's because it's just I'm very concerned and I'd hope this person would be getting as much they've obviously gone through a horrible horrible time if they're that young and.
Uh, and uh, so I just, um, obviously, they, you can imagine what they've gone through to get, first of all, to get here, because, um, well, they haven't come from Europe. They've come from quite a distance. And uh, to be that young, there's, there's going to be a lot of trauma there. So I'm, I'm very, uh, of course, I think we're all quite concerned that these people are getting like, the highest level of support we can possibly give. It would be my question. And uh, or are there any examples of support they would they would get, be offered or entitled to straight away? There'll be support from our virtual school in terms of their education. Obviously, we make sure that they have a health assessment. If they, if the health assessment, the initial health assessment isn't happening within the required time scale, if we think that there are any health needs at all then we will make sure that we take, we register all young people with a GP, we would make sure we took them to the doctors. If we thought they needed a hospital appointment, we would make sure we arranged that. Um, obviously our CAM service, and Tina might be able to talk about that a little bit more, we try and make sure that if there's anything around their emotional well-being, um, trying to kind of do whatever we can, if we can, to sort of contact their family members, but just trying to have an understanding and be sympathetic about their needs. What I would say about our unaccompanied asylum seeking, our cohort of unaccompanied asylum seeking young people, we have very good outcomes in terms of education sometimes with those young people. Um, so, but I think the, the you can't, I, I can't imagine the emotional turmoil they've probably been through. I think if you're 14 years old, I, as, an, as a grown woman, I would struggle with that. So I can't imagine what that feels like to be in a country where it's not your first language, um, if you've witnessed things, you might be suspicious of, uh, suspicious of authorities. If you're taken to be a, to a doctor, what does that mean to you? It, yeah, I can't imagine what that what goes through on person's mind. But we try and be as supportive as possible. Um, they have the same rights and entitlements as any of our looked after children um, to support and services. Thank you for that. I just um, echo that. I had got quite a, a good. Uh, well, I'll t say a good story. I, I met um, uh, someone who was a child as a, an accompanied Inspire when I w uh, asylum seeker when I went to visit Inspire, and their eagerness to learn. This one individual, I won't say any more than that, but was just um, brilliant. They they were on they were doing an English course, and they were planning the English the course they were going to do two courses into the future. Like it was like a little uh, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for where you stepping stones. Mm -hmm and they were already looking at the third one in their sequence, so it was really good to see. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Oh. Off we go. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, just to follow on from what Janet said and linked to unaccompanied asylum seekers, um, we, we had a case of the, one of the youngest young people who came in with his brother and we had his first personal education plan meeting and they were cuddling each other on the sofa and crying and the view was okay so we're here to champion education uh, but they just weren't ready for it at that point but they were in a very good foster carer there was a lot of good support around them with their social worker we got tuition in the home and first of all we got tuition to happen together because they didn't want to separate um, Build, we built up and then differentiated the, the tuition so that they could have it at the right level because there was an age difference. Um, but, and to cut a long story short, we got them into school, we got them into college. They're doing really well now. And they, I'm not saying everything's, you know, cured and fine, but they overcome that initial barrier. So it, it was a, a good multi-agency approach and we got them into good schools which were able to support their needs as well. Anybody else? Oh, Councillor Nott. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for the very detailed report which you have written. I'd just like to compliment you and your team for a well done job. I, I do know what you're doing is a, a job of passion as well as vocation. And looking at your report, um, you have mentioned that the overall performance of the service is good. I think it's really good. I just want to know is this offset graded or is it just internally graded? Um, so our performance is it's based on what's expected and required of local authorities. So it's benchmarked. So we have to do returns every year. 
all local authorities do returns. We're compared, like I said, against our statistical neighbours nationally and regionally. Um, there are certain expectations, you know, there are some figures that are good if they're high, some if they're low. Um, so obviously you want high percentages of children being visited. Um, you want low percentages of children more than 20 miles away from home. So we judge it as well. But actually, when Ofsted come to inspect, they will want to see all of our data. We have to run something called an Annex A report, which summarises all of that data. It's all numbers, and they have specialists who specialise in data, and they look at it, and they understand it in a way that we probably don't even understand it when it comes to data. Um, but what I would say is, you know, we look at that data regularly. So I meet with my senior management team every four weeks to look at the data. And we've gone from a position, I think, sort of, I don't know, seven, six, six years ago, where our data wasn't the best data, wasn't the most reliable, to a point where it feels more reliable. We're constantly questioning it. We know we're not perfect. We know there's things that we can improve on. And we do question that data. And we have moved from just counting, being counting, if you like, to asking what difference does it make? So what does it mean? So if we've got 100 of those, what does it mean for children? So we don't just look at the numbers, we also look at what does it mean and how can we improve on it and what can we do differently? So we're constantly trying to get better. And that's not to say it's perfect, so I don't want people to say I'm saying it's perfect, it's not. Um, but we think we have good data that tells a good story about what we're doing. Thank you very much again. Um, I know you're aspiring to be outstanding, and uh, one of the areas you have mentioned today as an area of improvement which has continuously been challenging to you is the area of initial assessment. What is it that, what challenges are you having? Is it something you're ready to share with us to find? Is there anything we can do to find a way of preventing this? Um, this has been a a subject that's being spoken about um, a lot, um, not just in this committee, to be fair. Um, there's a challenge in terms of shortages of paediatricians. Um, we have certain timescales, so we have five, the local authority has five working days to refer for an initial assessment. And after that referral is made, health have 20 working days to, for that initial health assessment to have taken place. With a shortage of paediatricians, um, it means that they don't always happen in time scale. Um, it doesn't mean that children don't have an initial health assessment. And sometimes they can be days late, um, but we have had occasions where they're much longer. Um, it's a constant challenge. It's not a challenge just for Thorock. It's a challenge across the region. Um, so I meet regularly um, with my um, equivalents across the region, and we are all experiencing the same thing. I think apart from Bedford, um, but they, I think they use a different provider, I think, if I'm right, Sharon. I think they use, yeah, they use a different they provider. Have their own, have their own Sorry? So they have their own yeah, and so they seem to be doing quite well. But um, I've worked in more than one authority, and it is always an area um, that local authorities struggle with. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try and get it better, and we are really working together to try and do that, but it's proving a challenge. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can I just come back on that? Because I'm aware Innes isn't here tonight. But um, on the task and finish that a group that um, Janet was referring to has been meeting, um, there's now a paper with the ICB Finance Committee in order to look at freeing up funds to secure more um, paediatrician um, time. Um, and, um, and we're hoping to hear within the next week. Um, obviously, they've got a triple lock at the moment as well, so they have to go through their processes. But the paper was finished and, and, and they have had it for about two weeks now, so we're hoping that we're here any day now. We have lined up some extra resource if that funding's agreed, so that we clear hopefully clear the backlog in quite a, a, a short period of time. Uh, Councillor Nodgy. Yes, thank you. I think you've addressed one of the questions. I was going to ask you if there's any kind of recruitment drive in place that could... Uh, be used to attract more pediatricians into the borough, but you, you've already addressed it one way or another. Thank you. 
think Councillor uh, Cecil has indicated, but I think yeah. is yours relevant to these points? Yes, is it? Right, I'll just right. come to you in one second, Councillor. Yeah, I, no, I don't I've, mind, I've, I've, I've gone through Thank, thank you. Thanks. I, I just want to be uh, where that uh, was. It was said that the report is now ready. Would that be coming uh, to corporate parenting or health and wellbeing next? Because I know this is also heard at health and wellbeing and at the Times Children's Overview and Scrutiny as well. So I'd assume it would next be going to health and wellbeing. So it's actually, uh, Councillor Carter, just there, it's a, um, it's a business case for more funding. So it will go through the ICB processes because it, they're supplying the funding. So... I mean, you would have to ask Innes and the ICB if they want to, you know, they, they've done the business case. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't see it going through your structures because obviously it's um, in order to access funding. And yeah. no worries, I just thought it might, um, might come through internal as well, uh, just so that we get, we get the update here. But I'm, I'm sure that will be for the, the next uh, committee. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you should get an update report on, 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 on uh, you know, a written update report on what the outcome is. But um, the actual kind of request, unless you've got any spare money <laughs> <laughs>you said earlier about oh sorry hello um, about the uh, young children the unaccompanied uh, asylum seekers uh, going into mainstream schools out with the census because I know how schools are so critically judged now on, on their budgets what their census figures were so in comes two or three uh, young people who, who've got real strong needs. So how is the funding arranged to support these uh, asylum seekers? Well, the school would put them on their school roll and then when the census returns happen in October and January of each academic year, the um, ESFA or the Department for Education or if they are local authority maintained, which in this case they weren't because they weren't in Thurrock and we're, we're academies anyway. Um, if wherever, whatever school they're placed in, the funding would be directed to them. But we use our Pupil Premium Plus funding as well, which we allocate to the school in, in case they do need to provide an extra resource. But our expectation is that they are providing support as part of Quality First Teaching that meets the needs of all children because we have English as an additional language that's spoken by um, children, young people in many schools across the country, not just by our unaccompanied asylum seekers. What schools do need support with is perhaps the um, variety of language um, or the um, uniqueness of a dialect. Um, so again, we support the, the young person or the, the child and the school with giving them access to different resources that's going to support that. But with the willingness to learn, many of our unaccompanied asylum-seeking children um, obtain English quickly. Mm. Um, they, they have the skills to do that. And, um, but we would be expecting the schools to, to provide the right level of support for our children, as we would any child. Yes, yes. So it sounds very much as though you've got a very close working re relationship, so you know that the um, extent of the provision of the schools you place, so you're comfortable. Is that is that the case? Yeah, we use a, a variety of methods to find out if we feel that the school can meet need. So working with the foster carers to see if, the, you know, the fo does the foster carer have a familiarity with that local school for example mm -hmm. um, what's their previous experiences we look on online on their websites to look at their offers we look at their Ofsted inspections and their grading and we have conversations with the schools before the applications for the school place are made you know do they have a nurture unit for example do, do they have additional facility for support staff that kind of thing mm -hmm. and then once they're placed um, they have to have a personal education plan meeting where 
specific targets and actions and interventions are planned anyway and that's reviewed every term so that that is part of the working relationship we have with them and their quality of provision is underpinned by us allocating the pupil premium plus which they use to support individual needs oh thank you very much thank you for that um Okay, before I uh, get round to the recommendations, I'd, I'd just like to quickly come back to the comments you made a short while ago about the uh, the two children. And what that sort of does really highlight is obviously there are many successes and good stories to be told, but we know it's not a sort of bed of roses out there, isn't it? So there are, uh, and I would like to actually just come back to Janet and just say, you know, thank you very much for the report. And you did, you did touch on the fact that, um, you know, we do perform very well and you're very... You know the hard work and everything that goes into the service, and I'd, I'd like to sort of just reiterate that. And I know, I know you work incredibly hard, and I know the whole service really deserves every every inch of sort of congratulations that it gets. So thank you very much for your support. I'll just move to the recommendations. Yeah, if that's okay. Um, and it's that members note improvements in the children's social care and note the work that is undertaken to ensure good and improving performance. Members scrutinise the performance data and then provide challenge to the service as required. And how, the second page, and how corporate parents we provide appropriate services, keep children and young people safe, and promote good outcomes. Have we have all that? Yep, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, and with that, if we could just move to item eight. Um, slightly unusual circumstances with this, and I will sort of just get into that in a second. Um, we do have a report in front of us, but unfortunately there's no one here to present uh, the report. So, and I just I just have made a few notes to go along with this. Um, yeah, regretfully we don't have a representative from the ICB at present to present this report. Apologies were received last week. Um, so any questions that the committee will need to be sent to Stephen Mayo, and I think Luke will be able to provide the email address to facilitate that, uh, obviously once we move on. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the ICB uh, will not be able to support evening meetings as they are outside the core business hours. Um, and this is a quote, we would be welcomed uh, for an opportunity to discuss a way forward so I will leave that there. Um, and this was sent by Stephen Mayo, Director of Nursing, with kind regards. So it's it's regrettable that nobody is here this evening to present a report. Um, and the reasoning for that I also find very regrettable. Um, we are an evening meeting. We do sit in the meeting. There are a lot of people put their time out to um, deliver content to this committee. Uh, dates are known right the way through the year. Um, so I don't know what to add to that really, I'm bitterly disappointed and, and when I received this email last week I was quite shocked actually and I understand it's been escalated so I won't say any, further, any more than that. Does anybody have any comments about the report itself? Councillor Carter. As a process, um, like I think members would like a chance to scrutinise and get um, like answers on this report. Uh, can we at all look at, uh, I know we've, if we look at the work programme, this is the last one of the year, isn't it? Yep. Uh, but if we could put this off uh, so the report comes back, I believe that's only f fair for us to be able to look at it and scrutinise it properly, in my opinion. Yes, um, obviously I think we can by way of this report, we you know we can collate any questions that do come forward, and I'm, I'm sure Luke will be able to deal with that, and they might be then be able to be forwarded on for uh, correct um, process with Stephen Mayo. Um, as, as I understand it at the minute, there isn't a way forward for representatives to join the evening meetings. So I don't know how that's going to progress. I don't know what sort of discussions are going to be had. Um, so I, I can't really answer and input any more on that at the minute. So, does anybody have any questions on this report or comments, no. Councillor Hartsley? Thank you. Um, just as vice chair, just to echo the comments, um, chair, that you've made already. I know that I, I did um, contact you in the week as well to yep. discuss this. Just to say that I am also disappointed that there's no one here 
to discuss this of an evening. Obviously, there's lots and lots of officers here that have given up their time, um, and I just wanted noted that it is disappointing. So, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we do have one recommendation to go with this. Um, the information contained within this report to be noted by the Corporate Parenting Committee. Everyone in agreement? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sorry, okay. yeah, we've got a list through 1.1 1. Yeah. 1 through to 1.6, haven't we? Yeah, well, I think we should just uh, note the, the information contained within this report to be noted by corporate parenting com committee members. We just all agree that one and then drop the other five. I think yes, I'm the, happy with that. The best way forward yeah. if them services agree. Yeah, yep. probably why I did that. Yeah, that's great. OK, everyone in agreement? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, committee. Very sorry if we can move on to item 9, which I believe now Tina is going to present to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just in terms of um, referrals for looked after children to CAMS um, during the year January 23 to December 23, um, we received 34 referrals to our locality set CAMS team. 33 of these were accepted and one wasn't. And the reason why that one wasn't is because they'd previously just had a consultation. So the single point of access that screened those referrals were able to go through the uh, report of that consultation and the social worker was satisfied that that had been revisited and therefore didn't need a referral. So 33 um, looked after children cases received a child, um, a looked after child consultation stroke assessment. So we prioritise children that are looked after within set CAMS and that means that we fast track their referrals to the service and we undertake a um, consultation stroke assessment within 10 working days. Now, the reason we call it a consultation is because um, we receive feedback from children looked after that said that it's quite disruptive to them to come to that initial assessment and have to give a very detailed um, background. And so what we've done is put in um, that we meet with the professionals around that child first so that we can collect all the information, any previous psychological assessments, SDQ scores and just talk to the, um, the social worker and possibly the foster carers as well so that we can get all that detailed history without the child necessarily being there. And then from that, from that consultation we're able to determine um, what type of um, follow-up assessment that might be required and then invite the young person in to um, that second part of the assessment. So um, of those 33 referrals, we have five that remain open now um, to CAMS and 28 of them received intervention and then were closed um, and have been discharged. So um, we've just listed here some of the sorts of interventions that those young people received um, during their period of working with CAMS. And within every one of our locality CAMS teams, we have a looked after child lead clinician. And that is somebody that oversees all the work um, of that team, working with looked after children. And they keep an oversight of their journey through the um, CAMS provision. And they will liaise with um, other CAMS teams should those children be placed in other areas. So it's a really important role because they have that oversight. They meet monthly all together as a looked after lead um, team so that they can sort of have um, reflection and think about services and how we can improve services for looked after children. As I said, we fast track um, all looked after children assessments and so going back to unaccompanied um, young people, we would um, fast track their assessments as well and make sure that they um, had a speedy 
um, intervention. Once we've had that initial assessment, we produce a report to the social worker, um, allocated social worker, within five days, just outlining the intervention that we feel would be best for that young person, so that there's a, a sort of... And one of the reasons where we think that that is really important is that we know that sometimes our looked after children can move quite quickly as well. Um, so we want them to have an assessment and a report that gives the outcome of that assessment so that if they do move, that that can move with them and they can then be um, linked into the right appropriate intervention in another area. So again, just going through, you know, why we think uh, looked after children are a priority and obviously it's just recognising those vulnerabilities and ACEs and, and what brings them into our attention in the first place. So there's just a bit of information around that. With all our children, we use outcome measures to make sure that the um, interventions that we're offering them are the right interventions and that they're actually helping the child to progress. So we use that. And, young people find it quite helpful so that they can measure their own progress through the work and um, we we capture all of those so that we can see that process and also um, when a child is discharged from the service we're able to give them their outcome measurements so that they can see the areas of work that they really improved in. In, in Thurrock locality team, they consulted with the young people around the outcome measurements and they made some adjustments to them based on what young people told them. And there's just a, um, an example here of how they adapted that tool so that young people were a bit happier at filling it out. So um, other services around that is that um, social care and um, thorough set cams have a once a month meeting between ourselves just to think about any young people where there's any, we've called it an escalation meeting, but really it's just to think about any young people that have got particularly complex needs that we need a sort of discussion around how we're going to support those young people together. And um, some of those young people are young people who are in um, tier four or inpatient accommodation. And so therefore we make sure that our um, social care partners are aware of those young people and that we've got good plans in place for when those young people are discharged from inpatients. Um, recently we undertook an audit of all our looked after children work across um, the whole of South End, Essex and Thurrock um, to see whether we were actually meeting that quality indicator of the 10 day to assessment and across the whole service we found that 90% of those referrals did actually get an assessment. We were slightly higher scoring in Thurrock but across the whole as an average we it was 90%. And the reason why we weren't achieving the 100% was because of capacity of social workers to attend those consultations within such a tight time frame. And also the number of consultations available from set CAMS clinicians. So we've put some measures in to kind of help us with that. So we ask social workers if they can be aware of trying to make themselves available within 10 days to have that consultation once they're making that referral. Obviously, sometimes it just falls a day or so outside if a, if a social worker is called to call or has something come up that they have to attend, then they might just be a little bit late in attending those meetings. One of the things that was of concern to us when we undertook the audit was about how we capture young people's voice. So although we've um, taken young people's voice to say that we don't want to bring them in at that first point and hear their whole developmental sort of history, we also are very keen to make sure that we're capturing the child's voice at that meeting and as professionals all meeting together that we're able to do that and um, you know bring the child's voice into it and we sort of felt that through our audit that we weren't doing that as well as we ought to. So um, again we've put some measures in place, our participation lead has met with young voices so that they can um, really ask them about the best way to capture young people's voice in that meeting. We've asked social workers to talk to young people before they come to that consultation meeting and bring the views of that young person to that meeting with them. 
And if we don't feel that that has been captured in the right way, the clinician will contact the young person directly after the consultation to ask them their views so that we're making sure that it's not just the professional view that we're capturing, but that we are um, hearing the young person's voice. One of the other things that we felt we needed to do was um, improve access for looked after children because, as you can see, we've had 34 referrals, but, you know, we wanted to make sure that there are looked after children know about our service and could access the service if they wanted to do so. For young people over the age of 16, they can um, make a referral to us without going through their social worker if they want to do so in, in the same way that we would accept referrals from 16-year-olds. So um, we wanted to make sure that they know how to access our services and that's part of the work that our participation lead and our local clinicians have been doing with the Young Voices group. The other thing we were um, asked to consider was around being a little bit more flexible in terms of um, access to young people that are looked after. So in order to make sure that we're seeing the flow of young people that are referred to us, we have to, you know, if somebody doesn't attend appointments, we write to them, we try to engage with them, and if they don't engage, then unfortunately we have to close them because we can't keep um, young people open if we don't see them but we've got some uh, additional measures that we put in place for looked after children to enable them to have more missed appointments just because sometimes you know that they find it really difficult to come to um, appointments because of their previous experience of working with professionals so we put in some additional support around that. Obviously, um, it's not just our locality team and all the provision that they've got, that are the services that are delivered for all young people, including children looked after. And we've got our specialist services in CAMS as well. So that's our eating disorder service, our, look, our learning disability service, and our crisis services. So our crisis service offers um, assessments at A&E um, for those young people that present in crisis. And we also have a therapeutic home treatment team. And what we're trying to do in terms of that therapeutic home treatment team is to try to stabilise children in the community and try to prevent them from needing an admission to an inpatient unit um, by offering them some intensive support. And we're finding ourselves sort of be, uh, going along to residential units to try to stabilise young people, particularly in residential units, Children tend to be a lot more settled in foster placements, but in some of the residential placements, uh, we work with the staff group to try to think about how those young people will be stabilised and how we can work with those residential homes and social workers to put in a package of support to stabilise those young people and prevent them from escalating and needing a tier 4 um, place, um, hospital admission. Our crisis team offers a 24-7 service and so they're available 24 hours a day and um, they work over the weekends as well. So that provision is there and we can do support calls as well to um, children within their homes. Also, we've um, recently put in place that if a looked after young person is seen at A&E for a crisis assessment, we ask all the professionals involved with that young person to meet within 24 hours so that we can just make sure that the plan is really tight in terms of um, making sure that child is properly supported and has the right intervention. Um, we also have our co-located um, CAMS worker within our youth justice team and um, within our youth justice team we also see looked after children and most of those looked after children that we see in the youth justice team like many of the children that we see in the youth justice team are, are it's, have experienced high levels of trauma so um, you know that um, CAMS worker works within that team offering an assertive outreach model so because it's a particularly hard to reach um, group of young people so there's just a case study there just to outline an example of a piece of work that was done with um, that, a child within that service. 
PAMS also offer services to um, foster carers. We'll work with foster carers to collaboratively care plan for our children and work together on those care plans. We offer psychoeducation, training and skill building, and uh, just some regular communication and monitoring. Um, obviously, we want to make ourselves um, very available, so our Thurrock team has a sort of hotline for um, social workers to be contacting them around looked after children, and hopefully so, uh, foster carers feel that support as well. Transition planning, we, we obviously have to work with our adult service provider and uh, put in plans for children at 17 and a half who are going to need an adult service. So we need to make sure that we've planned well for those children leaving our service and going into adult services um, to make sure that all their needs are going to be met and the transition is a smooth one. And also we have obviously children that are looked after children to Thurrock but placed in other parts of uh, South End Essex and Thurrock so we link in with those lack, uh, looked after children leads across in other teams so that we've got the oversight of those uh, Thurrock young people even if they're not placed directly within Thurrock and um, there's just another case example there of um, a child that lived outside of the area just for you to have a look at. So our team manager, Dean, uh, prepared this report, but unfortunately he was called away and isn't been able to attend uh, tonight. So but if you've got any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. It's a very detailed report. Thank you very much for that. Um, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Mauer. I just have a quick question. I think you touched on it already, but to do with the outcome rating scale, I just wanted a bit of, like, I guess you could say clarification. Or I'm just interested to know, does the form that's given, um, is it like a universal form given to all children? Like, depending on the age, how do you, like, approach kind of getting that information? Because I guess information to do with mental health is quite a sensitive kind of thing, and it might be hard to kind of, depending on the age, I think, obviously... You know, you're gonna have to maybe approach things slightly different right ways. So, just interested to know, like, how is that done? Maybe that's just more so for my own kind of interest, but it'd be interesting to hear about it. Yeah. So they are um, racing schools that are done on on paper. We we do have sort of tablets that we can use and things like that. But in actual fact, we do most of them on paper, and um, they're grouped into age groups as well. So it is different age group. Um, you know, depending on the young person's age. We use um, a standard sort of measurement, but we do, we have to collect two measurements um, as a minimum so that we're collecting it at the first point and later on in the treatment at closure. Sometimes we do more than that, so if we're having a group intervention, we'll do group rating scores at every session. And also there are specific interventions that use their own specific measurement as well um, because it's sort of geared towards the intervention. So there's a range of them really, but we have the, base, the core ones that we um, use for all children. Obviously also we're very interested in the SGQs because that's what um, social care collect for looked after children. And so we can um, have a look at those as well to um, measure those young people and get their feedback. Thank you. I think just to add to that, I mean, they're a way of, of the young person as well themselves rating and, and kind of seeing themselves improve. Um, uh, you know, a lot of young people really like them because they can actually, they might not have been a good day, but when they're rating the week, they can see actually things are improving. Have them. Um had to modify some of them around some of our young people who um, might have social communication difficulties as well because they find it more difficult to rate themselves. So again, we need to adapt the, the tools for those children. So, yeah, it's okay. You, you'd like to go back in, would you? Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm really happy with the answers. Oh, right. oh, no, thank you. Like, it's, there's a lot more clarity. It's been added. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Fantastic. I think we've got Councillor Carter first and then Councillor Lodgy. Thank you uh, very much for your report. Um, one thing I, I, I wouldn't say I liked reading, but um, it, it's good to see uh, more, um, more stuff on trauma 
Like it's certainly been in the last five to ten years, this has become something that's a lot more talked about in the service. And it wasn't before I, was, I actually took a job in a um, care home a year and a half ago, and I had I had the benefit of being able to do tr uh, training on trauma there. And it, to describe something as like a light switch moment in seeing why some people act the way they do, I cannot overstate um, how good this training is. So I was just. Um, well, I wanted to go into a bit more detail on uh, and what trauma workshops or et cetera you would, you would offer the young people. And if you've got any examples, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. So we have um, different interventions for trauma, really, so depending on the young person's needs. So, for instance, you know, we do hold some trauma groups, um, but we, most of our trauma work is one-to-one. -one. Um, intervention with young people so uh, we have CBT for trauma um, that's specifically geared towards trauma we have um, EMDR um, but a lot of the work with trauma is about building a trusted relationship with that young person so that you can really help them to um, you know kind of understand that trauma and move through it really so I think we've got sort of specific modalities to work on that but it is the relationship and that somebody taking a real interest in that young person and forming that sort of therapeutic alliance with them i don't know if you wanted to add anything sharon no i think you covered it i just wanted to say that e em one and um, that's the eye movement one yeah. isn't it? yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's, that's i just yeah. wanted to clarify <laughs> well, it's more of a repetitive movement yeah. isn't it that because uh, it, it might be eye movement for some but some tap people some tap people tap do tap in yeah that's just uh, just uh, just wanted to clarify that because i wasn't actually familiar with the acronym oh, but sorry. then i was trying to yeah. work it out in my head i was like is that eye movement okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, thank you for the detailed report, which you have um, explained here. Uh, looking at the young, um, the feedback, which is on page 21, presented by the young people who were here, uh, they did actually mention the difficulties they will have if they do not have family network. And they did also say it could impact on their mental health care. Mm -hmm. Hence, you have commented on transition planning here, which is a very good um, uh, program there. I just like to know what type of programs does these agencies provide for young people who are transiting? Well, we we actually have um, a provision for young people that decide that they don't want adult mental health services. So um, there is a provision in Thorac. It's called. It's not progressions, it's is not it? Progressions, no. It's can't remember the name of it. Either. Sorry, because um, in the rest of the county we have progressions, and in this, oh, in Thurrock, we it's have. Mind, young minds. Yes. Isn't it? Uh, we have like a transition worker that sits within young minds, and they deliver services that are supportive of young yeah. people, um, but not necessarily a statutory adult service. Mm. And they will mentor those young people, they will help them to perhaps. Um, engage with community resources around how they're going to progress into adulthood and get that right yeah. support. Yeah. That's if they don't want or need an adult provision. If they're going to adult mental health services, then we engage with the adult service and we um, have a discussion about that young person. We're able to bring them in and introduce them to their um, adult worker at an earlier stage so that they can be prepared and get used to an adult service ahead of time because it is quite difficult to to sort of access an adult service at 18. It's quite young for you know, a lot of those adults in adult services are a lot older. So we've also done some work with EPUT, who are our adult providers in South End, Essex and Thurrock, just to think about um, the needs of young people transitioning there. And they've held some focus groups and have actually adapted some of their services to try to engage with those younger cohort of people going into um, an adult service. Not all young people perhaps will need an adult mental health service, but they might need an adult social care service if they've got special needs. So again, we work with our social care partners around what that's going to look like when they um, transition into adult provision. 
It's just to say thank you. Thank you for uh, elaborating on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I've just got one one small question. It's on uh, page 82, um, and it's quite early on in the report. And it just refers, it says the 28 uh, cases, um, they've, they've, they've received a level of intervention and have now since been discharged. But is there a kind of like a, a, a follow-up mechanism to that, where these, in theory, these, these 28 actually get rechecked or... Do you know, as a, as a, as in a kind of a post way, or, or do you actually then wait for maybe any new instances to arise out of those 28? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so um, we, we don't check up on them um, after we've discharged them, but what we do is we have a re-referral um, process so that if those young people needed a service again, they within six months they would just be reopened by the team. That's crossed our service. Um, but also we have this hotline that is between um, CAMS and the social care team. So any of those young people, if the social worker was worried about them, that there was any relapse or anything, they would be able to contact the team and have a discussion, have a consultation around them. And if we felt that we needed to review them, we'd bring them back in to review them. Obviously, part of the discharge, we're always looking to prevent relapse. So part of the discharge planning and the letter that we use as part of the discharge is looking at, you know, if these symptoms emerge again, what they could do to try to reduce them or to reduce that um, escalation of any symptoms. So, but it's quite a fast re-entry into CAM, so, and because we prioritise looked after children anyway, they wouldn't have to wait long to come back in. Okay, thank you for that. Any, any other questions? Wendy. Oh, Jackie. <laughs> um, your, the psychoeducation and the training and skill building, is that something that's open to foster carers that live outside of the area with a sorry, foster child? Or is that just if you're living within the area and not maybe Essex or South End? Um, that's something that we would offer across South End, Essex and Thorrock, but not further afield than that, I'm afraid. Um, I actually took a Tier 4 child from residential care um, or from a, a psychiatric unit. Um, he'd been sectioned twice consecutively. And I was desperate for support. Um, we were having the CPA meetings and everything, and everyone was saying, why am I not getting support? But I was never, I'd never even heard of these, to be honest. And yet we were under CAMS for quite some time. And I'm just surprised if it's something new. I mean, this would have been, what, 31 months ago. And that's within the Thorough area? I live in Brentwood, which is Essex, yeah, but yeah. a Surrey child, obviously. Yeah. So. Okay, well, you should have received that. So, in actual fact, when a child is discharged from the Tier 4, we would usually have a discharge package around that child, and as part of that, you should have received that support. So, I don't know if you would like to send me some details of that so I can look into why you didn't receive that. That's fine. I'm just no future reference that it is something that we can access because I really could have done with some support absolutely, around absolutely. the behaviours and things like that at the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So Thank I'm you. sorry that you didn't get that because you should have. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you, Jackie. Um, well, before I move to the recommendation, I just would like to, a bit remiss of me, I would like to thank Dean if he's watching online for, for that report. And obviously, mm -hmm. once again, thanks for presenting that. Um, I think we've got one recommendation, which is the member's note and comment on the report. No, All good. No, thank you. And that brings us very nicely on to item 10. Can I ask Claire Moore to present? Thank you. Thank you. So this report provides an overview of the numbers of children looked after within the youth justice system in Thurrock, those that are in custody, those receiving a statutory intervention by the courts or diversion. Children's early life experiences have a significant impact on their development and future life chances. And as a result of their experiences before entering care and during care, children in care are at greater risk of entering the youth justice system than their peers. Looked after children are more likely <coughs> to be exposed to the risk factors established in research as associated with the onset of youth offending than the general population of children. 
So the primary aim of the youth justice system is to prevent offending by all children and young people. And the concept of child first guides the work of the youth justice service. In November 2018, the Ministry of Justice, the Home Office and the Department for Education wrote a protocol on reducing the unnecessary criminalisation of looked after children and care leavers. And that was based on the following principles. So every effort should be made to avoid unnecessary criminalisation of looked after children and care leavers, including through prevention activity, listening to and learning from children and young people, and we're back to trauma again. So all professionals working with looked after children and care leavers should understand the impact of trauma and abuse on development, and particularly their effects on emotional and behavioural development and self-regulation. Um, I can confirm that all of the um, Youth Justice Service are trained in trauma-informed practice. They were trained by um, the Forensic CAM service. And all local agencies should contribute to the understanding of local and national factors that can increase children and young people's <coughs> risk of being criminalised, such as going missing from school or their care placement and cross-area criminal activity focused on vulnerable children, such as county lines. So in response to the protocol, the Thurrock Youth Justice Governance Board, chaired by the Executive Director, the multi prioritises the multi-agency support given to children in care through regular scrutiny of the data via quarterly reporting and our local policy in relation to out-of-court disposals also refers specifically to looked after children. So I'm going to move on to some data now. So when considering the data, um, we do need to consider... Um, that the needs to be given to the very small numbers of children and young people that offend in Thurrock. So the numbers are very small. And benchmarking against other local authorities is not currently available, but there is now a revised data set um, via the Youth Justice Board, which was launched nationally in August of 2023, <coughs> which should make the benchmarking data available from quarter one of 24-25. So when looking at um, the Youth Justice Service's statutory outcomes, so that is all of the outcomes via the court. Um, as of the third quarter of 23-24, there were 31 children recorded as having statutory outcomes within um, Thurrock's Youth Justice Service, and six of these children were looked after. The six looked after children represented 19% of the young people competing statutory interventions. And that's, that's in line with, with the trend over the last five years. Um, there is also some data in relation <coughs> to children looked after that have um, either special educational needs and with an EHCP. Um, and during... Quarter three, 50% of looked after children on those statutory interventions with the YJS had recorded with SEND and an EHCP, and that is identical to um, the last financial year. Education, training and employment is, is reported on the last day of intervention and requires children of school age to receive and attend a minimum of 25 hours a week and those over school age a minimum of 15 hours per week. And during quarter three of 23-24, 50% of our looked after children on statutory youth justice outcomes were recorded as in full-time education or employment. And that again is the same as last year. So children looked after that are remanded to um, youth detention accommodation. So under the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, any child that is made subject to a youth detention accommodation order, so a remand into custody by the courts, automatically becomes looked after by the local authority. So no new children accommodation during the third quarter of 23-24, and we currently have one young person already subject to youth detention accommodation, and that young person is classified as CLA due to his remand in custody. He was actually looked after prior to being um, remanded. 
Um, so children looked after and the ethnicity of looked after children on statutory youth justice interventions. So during quarter three, um, 17 percent of the looked after children on statutory youth justice interventions were either black, Asian or mixed ethnicity. And this compares to 30 percent for the last financial year. So there has been a decrease. Um, the social care status for children on out of court disposals, so they're not court based, they're referrals from the police. Um, at the third quarter, um, dealt with 45 offences relating to 44 children, of which one child had looked after status. So the Thurrock Youth Justice System and Essex Police are committed to the national protocol aimed at reducing the criminalisation of looked after children. And this approach will be supported with a local Pan-Essex protocol to ensure that there is a focus on diverting any child, where possible, who is looked after from the criminal justice system. So in respect of the social care status for children discussed at the Thurrock Youth Justice Out of Court Disposal Panel during quarter three that had lax status, this, is, this compares to 3% with lax status from the last financial year. Um, that's, that's the end of my report. Is there any questions? Thank you, Claire. Any questions? Councillor Manuel. Um, I just have a quick question. Thank you, Chair. Um, regarding the decriminalisation of like, young people that have either been care experienced or are currently like, in care, mm -hmm. how does that work in practice or what sort of measures are going to be implemented um, by either the police or any relevant sort of stakeholder okay, so to I, make I, sure? I can give you an example of our out-of-court disposal panel. So a young person that has admitted to a low, lower level offence, um, there will be an assessment of, of that young person prior to coming to the panel. So we understand all the background of that young person. And then the panel, which is multi-agency, will come up with um, a suitable outcome if the child is looked after and there are already a number of professionals working with that young person, um, they will usually be given what's known as an outcome 22, um, which, which means that there will be no formal um, work undertaken with the Youth Justice Service because there's already a team of people that are around that person. Introducing somebody else might not be the right thing to do, but the Youth Justice Service will support either the social worker or the CAMS worker in, in undertaking some of that work to deter them away from further offending. Thank you. Thank you for the example. Okay. Thank you. Any, any further questions? No. Getting away light on that one. Well, actually, <laughs> Thank you. Um, like, actually, can I be excused? Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, I would like to say, I mean, I haven't got any questions either, actually. It's, I mean, I read the report and, I, and, it, and it kind of reads fantastically yeah. well to me. And it's uh, well, obviously, having heard your reports previously in the past, I think it's, it's, it's not just a case of rehashing old things. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can be excused. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, we've got. Oh, Janet. Oh, very sorry, Janet. Sorry. Just to briefly say, Claire's come in on her day off to do this, so that's why she's asking to be excused. So. Well, thank you very much for that. And that actually... Even more that actually points. is... <laughs> I'm very glad that you pointed that out. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we have two recommendations to go with this report. Uh, the members note the work undertaken to safeguard looked after children and divert them to the youth justice system. Uh, that members scrutinise the data and provide challenging relation numbers of the children who have contact with the youth justice system. Everyone in agreement? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good night. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, if we could just uh, then go straight into item 11. Um, it's good to see you again, Keely. I know you did actually uh, give me a, a, a good portion of your time, actually, several months ago, actually, and we, we sat down and had a very nice conversation, so thank you for that. It's good to see you again. If you can make your pre presentation, thank you. Hello, so I'm going to go th through some key elements of the report, and you'll notice that the bulk of the report is in actually 
the annual report itself as opposed to the brief summary that's provided in the corporate parenting pro, um, recording mechanism. So the data that I'm providing is based upon the academic year um, ending in August 2023. Um, it's part of a statutory reporting um, section that I have to complete and I'm hoping that it details the varied um, work that we provide within the virtual school. Um, so the contextual data might look slightly different. For example, um, my, my cohort looks slightly larger, for example, 323, but that's because we include our 18-year-olds um, up until the end of their year 13. So we work with those um, young people as well. Uh, same with our unaccompanied asylum-seeking young children. Um, Unaccompanied asylum-seeking children has been uh, mentioned a few times today, and <laughs> bless you. And um, I just wanted to highlight uh, page one one eight, where I've spoken specifically about the actions that we've taken to support our um, young people, and the impact that it's had. So making sure that our high expectations that they're having access to formal education that the colleges and providers are supported and challenged to meet their varying needs, that the resources are available to those young people to support them with the acquisition of English, um, and that we are supporting those young people that have aspirations for university or a particular vocation that they're interested in. The report then details a breakdown of um, our profile of special educational needs across our year groups and our cohort because we're covering um, children aged three through to 18 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a large area that we cover. Um, we now need to consider the fact that if I look, if I refer to page 119, when you look at our data relating to our early years and primary phase, you'll notice at the end of last academic year, our year five had the highest profile of special educational needs. What we need to bear in mind now is actually those young people are in year six and they're due to be uh, part of their statutory assessments uh, testing for the end of year six. So um, we currently have um, over 50% of our current year six with a special educational need. And overall, within our primary cohort, as I've noted, we had 46.5% as identified as having those needs. Um, the report then continues with a breakdown of the secondary phase for those young people in years 7 to 11. Um, so secondary school, key stages uh, 3 and 4. And then further on, it's broken down into um, post-16. Um, the question that I ask throughout... Uh, the reporting mechanism is is the so what question. Okay, I'm presenting this data. Well, what are you doing with that that knowledge, Keely, that you have? So, um, what we wanted to do is, and I think it's important to demonstrate the areas of need that are the primary categories. Um, so we talked about primary categories of need as to why young people go into care, etc. Well, in my context, I'm talking about the primary category of need linked to their special needs. So if I'm, I'm looking at page 120 now. So social, emotional and mental health still remains a big focus of intervention. So that's linking very much with um, our partners in Nelft and the reports that we've, we've heard from tonight, which again is underpinned uh, to some extent by that trauma and attachment. Um, many schools are using their Pupil Premium Plus to support our um, young people's emotional mental health. But as mentioned previously in, in other corporate parenting um, discussions, we do need to bear in mind that not all schools do have access to these services in, in terms of their own in-house capability, and, and nor, neither is it a statutory duty for them to do so. They, they have to have a person championing mental health, but they are that person that's trained to signpost rather than provide intervention. Um, I'll continue throughout through the report. So now I'm I'm going to focus on to one two three page one two three. So we very closely monitor all of our um, 
children and young people and we have specific actions that we take for those with special educational needs so um, we complete provision maps to make sure that the interventions that they're being provided with by their educational establishment is matching their individual need. Um, we still want to have good aspirations so if it's appropriate for our young people to be accessing um, tuition for example to meet age-related expectations we still have that that drive behind us it's not always possible um, and it's not appropriate dependent upon need so it's important that each young person and child is making progress based upon their personal education plan targets, but also their education healthcare plan targets. And they are very closely linked. And we work closely with their educational providers and social care and where appropriate health to make sure that everybody's working to, to meet that. So the impact of the actions that I've listed on one page one, two, three, is that we're able to provide teaching strategies used by educational practitioners to be more effective and support pupils to overcome their barriers to learning. Our intensive tracking is enabling progress to be scrutinised and for providers to be support and challenged to meet needs. And pro pupils are making progress against their individual targets and achieving improved outcomes. And again, that's shown by the data that follows on page 124, which compares our very small cohort um, um, and the, the, the data that's been provided nationally um, to show that our thorough children looked after with SEN, special educational needs, have performed better in achieving the expected standard in reading and writing and maths for key stage two in 2023, according to that matched published data. Um, I won't labour the point. I'm sure if you have questions about that particular section, you'll come back to me on that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about attendance because that was a big focus of our school improvement plan attendance nationally is down and it has been down since the pandemic um, it is making slow improvements nationally but there is a very big drive coming from the department for education to improve attendance rates across the country our children looked after have better attendance rates than non-looked-after children, and also compared to their peers who are looked after, our thorough children are doing well with their attendance. And we've managed to reduce the number of unauthorised attendants as well. So that's those ones that are refusing to go to school or we do not have a good reason as to why they're missing school. Um, so there's data that's uh, linked to that. And then on page 130, I've detailed all of the different actions that we've taken in order to address that. Particularly as we found that a lot of those young people who we would class as being persistently absent, so that means they have below 90% attendance, a lot of that may be underpinned by something called emotional-based school avoidance. So we've had a very big focus with that, um, with our young people by providing training, uh, to to our schools, but also to our social workers, we're offering it to them as well, and, and they're showing more and more interest to see how everyone can support that. And so some of those things might be um, going into school and completing what we call a stress survey, so talking to the young person to work out what are their push and pull factors, um, providing those emotional-based school avoidance training and support and resources, and each of our young people have an individual action plan to try and support attendance. And then we've put, I've put some impact again as part of that. Um, exclusions and suspensions, um, page 131. Uh, so we had 16 school age pupils in our cohort last year that experienced a fixed term exclusion, although that's now being called suspensions. Um, this equates to 8.1% of our total school age cohort. It has increased by 2% on the previous year, although it is below the national CLA average of 12.55%. So we are therefore doing better, but we know we always want to do better than that. Um, there are a range of um, things that we do to try to prevent 
exclusion. There are a number of things that we do to maybe reduce a period of exclusion. But there are cases when some of our um, children and young people have acted inappropriately in, you know, to the school's behaviour systems um, and, and they have had to um, be suspended from school for a period of time. I want to just refer you to page 132, which has quite a good case, stu case study example of um, an action we took and what we did to support one of our young people that actually came into care and then was excluded and, and was at risk of permanent exclusion. So um, we had a, a lot of positive work with that. Um, going on to page 133, it, there's a breakdown of children who were missing education in July 23. And there's an overview of how that pattern emerged across the course of the year. What the data doesn't show you, and that's because I wouldn't be able to show you in terms of detail of who, is... The, the transition of um, how how many young people we've got school places for during that the course of that um, academic year. Um, what we did find as a challenge was those unaccompanied asylum seekers that came into our year eleven year group. Um, it's very challenging to to get uh, young people into school um, in year eleven. Um, particularly if they're coming into care after March or they've just come into the country after March. So we've actually had to provide our own educational provision um, to support them and then look at the transition pathway to um, East Seoul when they're, when they're moving up to post-16. Um, I'm then going to move on to um, attainment data. And I hope, as I've worked within Thorock for it would be 10 years in June. It was very focused on attainment when I first came to the council to talk about that and to report. But I'm, I'm hoping that this report is illustrating the broad and varied work that we actually do and it isn't just focused on numbers within boxes. Um, I am an educationalist in my background and I do realise numbers in boxes do count but we also need to think about the nuances that go behind that data. Overall, um, and there's a breakdown of different areas that we, we've covered, um, we had a big focus on what we call our phonics data. So that's for our year one pupils, and this is on page 135. Our year one pupils are very small in, like, well, small in stature, but they're very small in number as well. And so it's really sometimes quite difficult to, to have that comparison because I'm not looking at 60 children each each year if I you know if I was a two form entry um so the data does show a, de a decline um however I could only base that upon the five pupils that were in care for 12 plus months and um, with 33 percent of the cohort having a special educational need it's very difficult for them to be achieving the age-related expectation in that phonics test that they do in June However, they will have a chance to repeat that again in um, year two, um, in June of this year. But we do provide a lot of resources to support the acquisition of phonics. And when I'm talking about phonics, it's about the pure sounds. It's being able to demonstrate that a C is a K and, and be able to use that to, as part of their skill set for reading. Um, I'm going to move on to Key Stage 2 data which is illustrated on 136 and beyond. Um, this year had, we'd seen a decline overall for our matched pupils. So what I've done is actually I've shown you data that's matched based upon the social care census that is then matched against sen uh, census data that schools submit, which is then matched against data that is provided to the Department for Education on end of key stage attainment. The difficulty I have in terms of accessing data that is live and up to date is there's a time lag between social care census, that's not their fault, that's just when the social care census data is submitted, versus who's actually in my cohort at that time in the academic year. So here's an example of I have, um, I have data for a year, a year 11 pupil um, according to 
the, the NCER system that I've talked about in here, when actually that young person wasn't in care at all during year 11, but his data has been reflected upon our overall scores. That's why you've got a variety of data that I've presented. That's my data that I've collected for my live cohort for that year versus historical data. However, when we look at our pupils in year six who were actually in year six during the time of our academic year and who were eligible to take their standardised attainment tests, um, we actually did um, okay. We got 75% in reading, 67% in writing, 75 in maths, grammar, punctuation and spelling, 75 and reading, writing and maths combined was 67%, which you'll see on page 136 in my little table is actually better than other children. So that's good. You've always got to look for the data that you can work with. Um, so our children are attaining well and they're making good progress as well. I would say I've identified for our, our key stage two pupils from last year that there was an area in terms of progress that needed a bit of work linked to maths. We focused heavily in the past on reading and writing because previous um, cohorts had struggled with that. Um, we do provide um, tuition in a maths and in English, but in this particular cohort for that particular 12 children, they didn't make as much progress in, in their maths. Um, or they didn't score as appropriately as they may have on that day. But what we have done for our year sixes is we have offered them tuition again. So they've had tuition from year, a tuition offer from year five uh, through to year six to the end of their, their SAT tests. But then we've actually started to offer tuition again in year seven for any of those that need to make up that gap. Not everyone takes up that tuition offer, however. So um, we, we do our best with that. Um, page 138, we are looking at GCSE data. And from there, you can see with our published data, we are making improvements in something called attainment eight, which is an overall point score of the um, GCSEs that they took. And overall, we can also see that we have achieved better for those that were eligible and who were actually in care during that academic year for 12 plus months. Year on year, they are making improvements in terms of English and maths combined scores, which means they got the age-related expectation for English and maths. So I've, I'm hoping I've illustrated that um, for the committee. Um, our Progress 8 data is roughly the same it's it's not improved so that's an area that we need to look at um, further um, I believe it's because some of our children weren't eligible to take their key stage 2 tests or didn't take their key stage 2 tests but also progress 8 scores depends upon them having 8 GCSEs and not all of our young people take 8 GCSEs um, so that's why it's good to then look at that maths and English because that's the core elements that's going to underpin their future um, success. Um, I will continue because I realise we're getting to the end. Um, I've also highlighted in my report that for those young people who did not take a formal GCSE, I've detailed why they didn't and what they did instead, so and what the educational offer was and what equivalent qualifications they were offered as part of their year 11. Um, so my summary notes overall are for attainment is that those pupils who complete tuition really benefit from having improved grades. Of all the pupils who were identified for tuition and who engaged with the offer, they made the most significant progress and achieved better. The impact of tuition and additional resources that's been provided by the virtual school has improved overall outcomes for this group. And then there's a case study on 143. There's two case studies which illustrate that, that statement. Um, I have included case studies in our report 
um, and my team collect case studies throughout the year of the work that they're doing because it's important that we're analysing the work that we're doing, the actions that are being taken and the impact that it's having. Um, so I'm going to skip over them because I'm, I'm hoping that they have been read. Um, I do have to have a school improvement plan. I write it as I would have written it as a, as a head teacher when I was um, head teacher um, prior to this um, job. And um, we monitor our school improvement priorities every term and I report my progress to my governing board regarding that. We then further break that down within each of our key stages so that there are key actions that we want to cover, key outcomes and key impact that we want to achieve. So there's an overview within the report of the, um, the school improvement priorities. Um, funding and how I allocate funding is also something that's very important that I report. So from page 150... Is it okay over there? Are you all right? Sorry. I don't, um, please stop me if... <laughs> if no, I'm, I'm to. Okay, okay. Um, the allocation and impact of the pupil premium plus um, from page 150 onwards. So um, the government uses the census from the social care census, the SD903, um, and the government gets that census and looks at the amount of children and young people aged from reception through to year 11 who are eligible to receive pupil premium funding or pupil premium plus funding. It's then allocated to the virtual school head to distribute it to schools. And so there's a breakdown in my report as to how it was distributed. I have a pupil premium policy which is shared with schools each year. And the main purpose of the, fu the funding being delivered from the government is to improve educational outcomes and raise attainment and progress. So there's a detailed sp uh, spending overview of what we've used, um, how we've allocated it and what we've used it for to support learners. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a big breakdown um, and a detailed number, but you'll notice that the, the biggest element of funding that we use is, is that tuition. We use that to support those that are missing education that are new into care and who aren't making appropriate progress. So although the total amount of intervention funding exceeded our top slice amount, we were able to utilise some additional funding obtained in April 2023. Um, virtual schools were given some funding for catch-up or the COVID recovery fund, so we were able to use some of that as well. Um, and then I've basically just detailed some, some elements of that. Um, moving on to 155, another aspect of the work we do is to support the personal education process. Uh, the personal education plan process is a statutory part of the care plan. So um, the minimum expectation is that every child that's looked after between 3 and 18 years old must have that reviewed at least every six months. Uh, we request that it happens every academic term of, of the year, so that there's three points of, of that. Um, what we, our role as a virtual school is to support that PEP process by enabling people to access the platform that we use, um, by reminding people that it's due, but a large part of the work we do is to quality assure that PEP, because we use it to see, does the education match need, is the school supporting uh, the young person in the right way, Are, is progress being made, and actually it gives an opportunity for the young person's voice to be heard as part of their education and, and that process. So um, the PEP meeting is a dedicated time to discuss education and any barriers to learning, as well as celebrating achievements, and then to plan accordingly. This information enables the virtual school to check that the educational journey of each young person is, is, is making progress and providing support and challenges necessary. Um, I then detailed in the in the remaining part of the the report from page one five seven. There's a big focus on our post sixteens, and um, again that, un, that accompanies some of the questions that people may have had, and it also complements the report that was presented by Kate Koslova Boren in January. A 
about how we work with the aftercare team um, to, to produce um, and to support EAT. Um, so we've detailed on, on page 158 some of the support that we're providing and that we're working with our colleagues to do so. And then there's some testimonials um, from other young people, from other providers about the work that we do. Um, the, um, we have a range of uh, strategies and a range of interventions that we put in place to support people who are neat our young people um, so um, whether that's through tuition or whether that's through giving them access to recent exams I actually have one um, 18 year old young person who has who was working but has stopped working and has come back and approached the virtual school and said I really would like to do some qualifications now um, can you help me and I've said yes we'll um Use some pupil premium funding, we'll get you some tuition and we'll pay for you to go to a centre to do your maths and English GCSE. So even when they have turned 18, we try to remain with our commitment. Um, I've detailed as well some further information about what we do, things that we feel have made a difference, um, how we've supported our unaccompanied asylum seeking people. Um, young people and all the additional services and um, interactions with fellow colleagues and professionals um, that we do as part of our work um, and then some updates for what's going to happen next um, we we are committed to working with the children with a social work agenda uh, which is not yet statutory we are as a virtual school and as a national association of virtual school heads looking and working with the Department for Education to see how that can be made statutory so that we're trying to influence education outcomes for children before they even get into care. Um, and so that's, that's an area for development and they have said that we are going to receive more funding to support that, um, which unfortunately won't be enough to devolve to schools, it's just enough to increase capacity in my work in order to develop a strategy for that so hopefully there'll be more information as that develops with the department for education um, i'm going to stop talking now and if people have uh, any questions i would welcome them thank you Keely. um just before i just move on to another little another little bit i just wanted to uh to say i remember the last annual report that you presented and it was amazingly detailed uh, much the same as this one so I thank you for that and just while I'm there I just want to just draw attention quickly this page 114 you've actually listed the uh, your team the virtual school team so I'd just like to thank those as well obviously for their input and that's uh, it's obviously a job well done you're clearly extremely passionate and that was also pointed out to me last year when you did your last annual report so thank you very much for that I think I will just take the opportunity because I think time is just Moving on a little bit, I'd just like to be ex extending uh, standing orders. Um, so you'd like to move a motion without notice to suspend council procedure rule 11.1 to allow the meeting to continue beyond the two and a half hour limit. I think that's prudent at the minute. Everyone in agreement? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, any questions? Councillor Memoir. Uh, thank you for that report. It was really, really insightful and really, really interesting. And I wanted to start off with um, the fact that it's really good to see the positive outcomes for university students and that there's like 23 of them I think mentioned in the report who have going to an open university or getting into university so it's nice to see that progression from like when they're really really young to all the way into their adulthood that's really cool to see um I just had two questions my first question is to do the tuition that's offered because I think that's a really really good thing and you can see it's obviously there's a good uptake for it and there's that positive relationship um there but I just wanted to know, is there any tuition offered for, like, say a child wanted to go to a grammar school, for instance, and they wanted to do the 11 plus, like, is, does the tuition, I see it nodding because I'm assuming the answer is yes, like, in terms of like, the 11 plus or any sort of, like, specialist school, even outside of grammar schools, just maybe if they're at that stage. Okay, I'll take that as a yes, so that's good. Um, I'll also ask another question to do with the barriers to access to education, because you mentioned um, there are some students who either don't attend, maybe because they don't want to, or maybe other reasons so I just wanted to know in terms of like technology 
Um, how is it ensured? Because obviously it's a virtual school, so it's contingent on having access to the internet or technologies. Like, how does that work in ensuring that all the children that are like under your like care are always sort of um, able to access that? And if there's a problem or an issue, how does that get resolved and get resolved quickly? Because obviously that will be a barrier to their education. Those are the two questions. Thank you. Okay, so to answer your first question regarding the tuition, yes, um, we have had um, a small number of young people who have gone to grammar school um, and we have supported that and we currently have had requests. So if there are requests that are specifically aimed at, actually I'm interested in taking the um, 11 plus, then we support that too as part of our our general year six offer but it may need to be tweaked to support them to to achieve the the relevant testing regime that's part of that 11 plus um to to discuss your second point um i don't actually know why we're called a virtual school because we don't offer virtual education as such i don't know why i think we're called a virtual school because when we don't physically have a building it's not like a real school and our young people we hold on to them so I have a virtual school role where I know who's in my cohorts um, but our role is to make sure that everyone else is doing their job appropriately to support educational outcomes so we don't educate them per se we would expect them to be in an educational setting that meets their need to support those and our job is to kind of supplement that and challenge and support now in terms of access to information technology resources um, mainly that's provided by their educational establishment but if it isn't we would use pupil premium plus and i use quite a lot of your notice from the top slice that i've used that to support it um, and we support it if it's appropriate so we have some of our young people that might need an iPad to support them with various apps to help with their learning it might be that they've got a Chromebook to be able to access their online homework whatever so we do provide um, access to information technology um, but not virtual learning per se although sometimes the tuition offer could be online but if a young person requests it face to face we would um, request from the tuition company that it's a face-to-face -face personal approach rather than an online interaction thank you that was a misunderstanding on my end i thought it was literally online <laughs> so thank you for that um clarification that answers that question you wouldn't be the first <laughs> so thank you thank you i'm glad we cleared this up actually because the first time i saw it being, being someone that's afraid of technology i read it about oh my word what is, what is this so, so we've cleared that one up so thank you very much <laughs> And also, I mean, I was just having a little side discussion there with uh, Luke a short while ago, and it actually made me feel like I was back in the classroom, actually, when, when, you, saw, when you drew attention to it. So. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Once a teacher, fine. always a teacher, unfortunately. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Thank you. Um, make you sit in the corner if you don't behave, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Councillor Hartstein. Thank you. Um, just on page 131, um, Obviously, it's really pleasing to see that there's been no permanent exclusions for 11 years because obviously we know the outcomes for young people who are permanently excluded from school are very poor um, and then linking into obviously youth justice and youth offending. Um, just sort of about halfway down, we go on to talk about um, negotiating alternatives to exclusion and the two, not alarm bells, but two things just to focus on in terms of AP and managed moves. Um, are you? Do you have any concerns around off-rolling that schools trying to off roll instead of permanently excluding as a negotiation um for children looked after we don't allow that to happen um we may have to negotiate something alternative though because once that permanent exclusion mark is is on that record it's a legacy unfortunately so we do everything we can to avoid permanent exclusion or that certainly that label um, we would challenge off-rolling. I find that because we have that statutory element as, as our work, we can do that, which is why we want to try and support that for our other children with a social worker. 
Um, but yes, it, it's about working creatively to make sure that that young person isn't permanently excluded, but they're still receiving an education. So it could be that they're educated other than a school, um, EOTAS as it's called. Um, it could be that actually we say, well, they, they're not coping in this mainstream environment, so what other provision can we seek? So it could be a mixture of um, the school supplies work, we provide the tuition, and maybe they have two days of vocational um, but again, that's very much detailed within their personal education plan and also their, their individual intervention plan. Um, but as you rightly say, the, the prognosis for a permanent exclusion doesn't sit well. And for, for some of our young, you know, if, if you are permanently excluded, I couldn't, I couldn't direct a school to take a permanently excluded a child so um, for example we had a young person who came into care who had already been excluded before being in care and was at an alternative provision but when she moved to another area she moved to a different foster carer um, we were able to get her a mainstream school and so now we've we've got the view of well actually she could cope in this mainstream school with the right support it was heavily pastoral the support offer that she's having um, but it's, it's a good start for her. So it, it's about what can we do to get the best outcome. But I, I know that it is a national issue. Virtual school heads are aware that it's a national school issue, as are Ofsted. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Thank you. Um, and just linking on with that, obviously I totally appreciate what you're saying and in terms of the permanent exclusion being on the child's record. Um, but obviously for the child, if, if you're... It, or if not you, if the school is sending them off onto AP or, or they're sending them on a managed move, we're still saying that they can't come back. Mm -hmm. So there's still that sense of loss and rejection. Is, is there work that the virtual school does or would that be the social care team to pick that up or is it a bit of everything, just in terms of the, the, the sort of emotional well-being of the young person? It's a bit of everything and actually it's about what's happened to, to trigger that exclusion. Um, it could be that the school still has those keeping in touch meetings. We've got one young person at the moment who is unsafe on school sites. So we've got this EOTAS package for that young person. But the school is still keeping in touch. They're still doing pet meetings. They're still having links with her. And my expectation that I have set is, well, I'd still like her to return if that is a feasible, if that's something she's able to do, I still want that to happen. So um, the expectation is, is always there. Um, schools can off-roll young people after 20 days of them being out of area, though. Um, they are statutorily allowed to do that, in which case they then become a child missing education and, and I'm seeking an alternative, um, an alternative school place or an alternative provision for them anyway. Um, but... That, yes, sometimes the young person has said, thank goodness I don't have to go back there. But in other cases, yes, that's, there's still that, that connection with them and the work's done. But, but the schools generally still maintain that, that keeping in touch element anyway. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any questions? Just got one very small question. One very small question, if you could just sort of uh, give me a little answer. It's, it's actually on page 106, and it's the bullet point 10, and it kind of caught my eye. Um, I was wondering, could you just give us a, a quick explanation of what alternative, what an alternative education package is? And what caught my eye was the additional activity in equine therapy. In this particular instance... Um, Right, so I'll, I'll take your first point is about, so alternative provision is something that is not sitting in school in a classroom with 25 others um, all doing English or all doing whatever subject. So the alternative provision might be within that educational establishment, but it might be a different focus. Or generally what is seen as alternative provision is off-site, it's alternative to what we would all perceive as you know, general school. Um, so it could be a number of things. It could be um, some of the providers that there are uh, could be outreach work through um, 
William Edwards, it could or St Clair's, it could be outreach work that's via um, Circles Farm, it could be uh, BEP, which is another alternative provider. Um, alternative provision is also deemed as the olive, but you don't get to go to the olive unless you've been permanently excluded, so we, we tend not to do that. Um, but some of them do provide outreach for our young people whilst they're in school. Um, with, the, with regards to that equine therapy example, it's about, so this young person has a high level of social and emotional need and um, it's been very difficult to obtain a special educational needs placement that would meet those needs, despite many 30 plus consultations to find the right um, provider that would accept uh, this child. So working with the special needs department and social care, we looked at what offer could be provided. What would um, that young person engage with? What do they need? So, um, and that young person had a, an affinity to working with horses. So equine therapy was part of their um, SEMH needs, but also they're working towards a qualification to enable them to take that as a vocation. To, um, so those kind those kinds of things that's what i mean by alternative not our usual let's sit in we're all doing french for example or dt or whatever thank you very much very interesting any other questions no. oh wendy oh, councillor cecil first Big yep far away yeah thank you you may you mentioned that you reach into mainstream schools to get an early sight of somebody who's perhaps coming into care? Can't do that yet because we don't have statutory, um, we don't have statutory powers to do that. So if they're not already in care, we can't do that. If they are looked after, we do have that statutory power to go into a school and say, I'd like to look at the educational offer that you're providing for that young person. The Child in Need review in 2018 demonstrated that children who were subject to a CP plan or a CIN plan, or generally with a social worker, don't do as well as children looked after academically and don't do as well as um, non-looked after pupils academically. So that's why the government um, has increased our duties to have a strategic oversight, so to collect data, to look at things like patterns of exclusion. We can't go and individually casework because we, we don't have PR, we're not that corporate parent, um, but we can certainly work with um, schools to say, oh, I've noticed there's maybe a high level of exclusion or electively home educated young people and they seem to correlate with some of our social care cohort, not looked after. Um, can we talk through some of the barriers perhaps? So it's more of a consultative approach at this moment. Um, until somebody gives us a little bit more stick, should we say. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, Keely, for that. Um, just like to move forward now. We've got one recommendation. Uh, and it's... Oh, oh, I'm very sorry. Sam. It's getting late. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to um, thank Keely and their team because um, they've been very supportive of my young man um, through the last two years uh, where he's not been attending school um, due to anxiety and other things that's been happening. Um, but they've been able to get it now to the point where um, due to some funding that's come, I think, from the, um, the pupil premium and the alternative provision that he's at, um, he has tutors and then a mentor, and it's the mentor that's really turned the corner for our young person, which means that he's now going into centre to do his GCSEs, which uh, probably even a year ago, we, we didn't even get him out of the front door. So um, unfortunately, health couldn't do anything. Um, we went to CAMS. They just said, well, if he doesn't want counselling, then there's not much we can do. Um, but um, through Keely and her team being really persistent, we was able to find the right people to help our young person. So thank you. Mm 
Thank you, and apologies for that. <laughs> if we could now move to the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Carter? Um, yes, so um, I didn't speak on that. I, it does fall under my portfolio. I, I thanked Dem Services for a quick answer when I had the question on whether I could vote, but I just want to let committee know just to play it safe if there could be argued there's a conflict of interest. Here I am going to be abstaining okay. from the recommendation. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, the recommendation then is the committee approves the annual report of the virtual school head teacher for the academic year. 2022-2023 and uses this information to evaluate, scrutinise and, if appropriate, challenge the services that are provided. All in agreement? Yep. Thank you very Thank you. much. And with that we'll move on to item 12, which is the work programme. Um, now before we go any further, I would like to give sincere thanks to um, Janet and Dan if he was here, because I know she has assisted me greatly with this over the last year um, uh, and obviously we are now at the end of our municipal year um, uh, perhaps I could maybe just ask for that um, support building up for the following the uh, work payments coming I think the only really pressing item I think we're gonna I think whatever committee comes forward is going to be needing a sort of fairly urgent update on the IHA situation mm -hmm. and hopefully we will have a resolution with regards to the ICB and uh, See how far we move forward with that. Is, is that okay for you, Janet? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. We'll make sure that's on the um, proposed work programme that comes forward as well. Thank you very much. And be so before I wrap up the meeting, I just I would, as 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 obviously I touched on, it is the end of the municipal year. Um, so I would personally like to thank all the officers, and I know there's mm -hmm. some not in the room. Um, Kenna, for example, um, the corporate members, and all of the committee members, because I believe. I truly believe this year has been really, really good, and it's very, very pleasing for me. Um, you've made you've made things far more interesting, and 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 the input's been wonderful. And I know uh, Councillor Polly isn't here, and I'd like to extend that to her as well if she's watching online. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll close it there. So the time is now nine thirty nine, I believe, and I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.